guys, you ready? First episode um, behind the front door. Very excited. Thanks to our first guest. Let's do a cheer, a toast to Rhoda Waswas. Otherwise, I know her as Ro. <laughs> you know her as the Blonde Bomb Show. Cheers. Get it on. I'm excited. We wanted to do this series to give people a real life taste, not just during the process of buying a home, but what it's like after you own a home too. Mm -hmm. Real estate is very much a, I would say, a relationship oriented transaction. But a lot of agents out there look at it as just a transaction. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at TV, and I don't know about you guys, but I watch the blogs and everything on social media, and it just gives you guys the how to buy a house and the steps. It's very technical, nerdy almost. And we've done that, you know, for Great Homes ATL. But wanted to take the people behind the scenes of the relationship building, what it was like. Everybody has a story and everything connects us mm -hmm. on this journey. Um, and we couldn't have thought of a better <laughs> first guest than our good friend, Ro, who's really become family, you know, to us. Um, so, Ro, tell us a little bit about, uh, well, I said a was was. So, <laughs> <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background and... You know, how, you know, we'll talk a little bit about your journey to Atlanta, but where it all began for you. Well, yeah, yeah. Thanks for having me again. Um, I'm first generation Ugandan American. My parents emigrated here from Uganda in the 60s, um, set up shop in the Northeast. Okay. Uh, so we started in Boston. I was born in New York City, born and raised from the Bronx. Shout out to BX. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, grew up there all my life, and you know the the great thing about New York is it's a melting pot. So I got to see every flavor, every piece of culture, aspect of culture. So that really was the stepping stone for me, just becoming worldly in the sense that, you know, I learned what I learned just being in my natural environment and habitat. But it made me eager and itch to want to go out and see the world and explore it. So um, by day, I'm in tech. Um, I'm a tech professional, and. You know, being there up until about 2006, actually 2016, um, I started off in legal, kind of navigated my way past the 2008, you know. Um, That's when the crash happened. Crash. And it humbled me. I, I didn't have a check-in. I didn't have a savings. I didn't have anything. And also, you just didn't think about, if you grew up in New York City, about owning anything, uh, right? And uh, rented until the wheels fell off. All right. So the whole concept of, you know, home ownership was just point, like it didn't exist. Did your parents own a home up in New York? Did you get to like culturally too, like what growing up, like what did you, how did you view real estate up there? Did, was it like something you even thought about or is there anything? <laughs> you had to come from long money to own anything yeah. in the five boroughs. So right. Manhattan, Bronx, Brooklyn, Queens. Staten Island, you might get away with it because they have more space. Yeah. And we don't count Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, <laughs> no, sorry, Long Island. sorry, Long Island. Yeah, I did. Right. So, I mean, Westchester was the closest thing to the Bronx from where I was. Yeah. And it was just a fairy tale. You would drive through. We would drive through on the weekends just to kind of see and absorb the scenery, mm -hmm. look at the homes, and just kind of like manifest Which... and vision. Like, okay, maybe one day, but okay. not in this lifetime. No. And so, you, do, your parents owned a home and did yes. you grow up in that home and was there anything about that or did you just think well this is just where i'm growing up or did you not even really give it thought as far as you own you know home. you only own yeah so home ownership in new york for those who could attain it which would have been the middle class which right. i guess we were for a little bit yeah. in the 90s um were the brownstones the town homes mm -hmm. set up which are all attached they weren't separated mm -hmm. um so i took pretty big sacrifice and forfeiting, you know, a really good education at a private Catholic school. And I was like, you know what, I'll take one for a team and I'll go to public school and thug it out there. And in, in, in order for us to attain um, home ownership there. So we ended up in a, a two family town home. Um, we're still in that home today. To this day, my mother still lives there. My, pa my father passed in 2006. So um, that was the, you know, the, the entry way into home ownership and they purchased that house I want to say in 2006. Okay. okay. Um, so they've been in that house for a very long time. 
And so at what point for you, since, you know, home ownership wasn't being the New Yorker, it wasn't really like the aspiration, I guess. But at some point it became the aspiration because you left New York, relocated and then decided that, yeah, now I want to buy a home. So yeah. what or when was that switch from like not really thinking much about it to like, yo, this is the goal I want to buy a home? Yeah, I think if you grew up in New York back in the day and I'm dating myself now, it's like that was a time to be alive, right? right. So you just... You're living are, life in the 20s. You lived stuff. your life to the fullest. There were no consequences. Right. And again, 08 was yeah. the thing that woke a lot of us up because we thought, oh, well, that paycheck's going to come every Friday. We're going to keep partying Sunday to Sunday. Um, I ha My moment of you know reckoning, I think, came in 2016. By that point, I've been engaged twice. I was over just everything. And I said- It must be so hard to just keep getting engaged. <laughs> <laughs> the struggles. <laughs> but I, I was really in a dark place. And I, I, I do this to this day. I, I'm really a big believer. I'm not super religious. I'm very spiritual. But I, I believe in manifesting what I want sure. to this day. And you know, as, as dark of a place I was, I just sat in the dark. I turned my power off, turned the cable off. I sat, wrote a list of everything wrong in my life, relationships, career family, friends, you name it. And I just started writing off all of the things that I wanted to change. I didn't blame anyone. Mm -hmm. I said, I have to put in the work to change those things. So boyfriend, gone. Beyonce, gone. <laughs> um, family, I didn't cut them off. I just distanced myself because you know how family gets yes. in your way. And they're like, oh, well, that's not going to work out. How did you even make your way out to Seattle? Like what year was that? And well, what brought you out there? So that list. That list. <laughs> so that's that, where you sat and you were like, okay. Yeah. So then it was my oh, career. Nice. I was I was working a pretty decent job as an exec uh, in retail yeah. in New York. And then I kept looking for other opportunities. I wasn't laid off or fired or anything, but I just, I hated it. Mm. Um, so that kind of fueled me to just start looking. But in this, the New York City market at the time, I mean, after 08, you had you know, 100 year old law firms that dissolved overnight. The financial crisis yeah. also dissolved a lot of the- Lehman Brothers, all that stuff went on there, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so they're really one, I mean, it, it's a very incestuous market as well. Cause right. if you see someone here today, you'll find them at another job two weeks later, yeah. but that wasn't happening. Um, I had recruiters that stopped picking up my phone, you know, my clothes. I, I remember that because I was a part of that crash and I was a consultant yeah. um, in tech as well. Yeah. And again, talk about humbling moments because when I lost my job, I was the guy that they gave me a severance package. And so I was happy because I had always jumped out of a job and would be back at another one. With so not. And so <laughs> I, it was ironic because that was when we first met. So imagine us just meeting. He's up in New York. I'm in Atlanta. And he got laid off six months later. You know, it's true love after that. Yes. How who stays with something? <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Your coins have just been taken away from me. <laughs> but, I, but it was humbling because I, you know, when they gave me this sad story about why they had to let me go, yeah. I was just counting the severance. Like, I'm good. Thank you. You know, and then one <laughs> turned to two, two turns to two months. And I'm like, wait, where are the jobs? Like, yeah. I'm supposed to be in high, you know, high demand. You started working about life differently. You started thinking, what am I going to yeah. do next? Right? So I went to Costco, bought a lifetime supply of ramen noodles, a Snuggie. I was ready to just kind of thug it out for a while and figure it out. Yeah. But then what I noticed is a lot of the New York market was saying that I was good. I was good. They liked my credentials. They liked my skills, the qualities I had. But they couldn't afford it. Mm. They couldn't afford to pay me what I was worth. And I was like, oh, that's not cool. So I just expanded my LinkedIn searches and the hot job searches and Indeed and all that and said, instead of me focusing on the five boroughs in New Jersey, Connecticut, I started expanding 25 miles, 30, 40, mm. and the phone kept ringing. So I'm like, okay, there's something here. I don't need to stay in my comfort zone. It's time for me to branch out. And back then that was unheard. I was going to say, living in New York, I remember I moved down here in 2009, I think it was. 2010. 2010. Yeah. Um, but there's such a pride that if you live in New York, if you're from New York, there's just a pride that people have as far as like, you just don't want to leave. And you're in Connecticut too. I don't think so. <laughs> but, but so that feeling for you, when you went through that list and just kind of went through all the bad or just things that just were not aligned to where you're trying to go. Yeah. That really was like the deciding factor. And like, I'm leaving New York. I don't know where I'm going. I'm just leaving New York. And I didn't tell anyone. 
Like I told no one. My mother didn't know. My family didn't know. There was a guy I was talking to at the time. He knew, and he was he very fiance status yet, obviously. But... No, he was a rebound. Sorry, um, <laughs> but he was very supportive and because he was, you know, he was supportive, but he also was impartial. He wasn't mm. gonna sit there. If I went to my family and said, "Hey, do you think it'll be a good idea?" They'd be like, "No, you're gonna fail." Right. I match. Isn't that what that's and that's really you know it's sad though. And disappointing because I think that, you know, our families in our generation, yeah. I don't think that they look at or they were telling you that you're going to fail because they really like want you to fail. I don't think that they knew themselves like how to get more than what the employer was giving. And so mm. the, from a generational standpoint, it's more so like you get the job you stay there you collect your pension, you collect your 401k, okay, okay, yeah. you retire. And then you live happily ever after. I wish it was that easy. Right. But I think to this day, I think our families still kind of think that that's, that's the trajectory of right. your career. And so when you're somebody that's like, you have the entrepreneurial spirit or you're just like, I want more than what I see every day. It's almost like, why? What's wrong with this? This is fine. This is working out. So I, I think yeah. you know, our families are just, you know, it is at a higher rate than what you see and what you saw. So when you got that, you got a job offer. In Seattle? Yes. Okay. Um, and uh, this was unheard of at the time because, like, you know, I, I was so used to the New York market and, and all the, you know, what would be considered benefits or perks to the job. The job was the perk to me. Right. <laughs> right. Right. But now, it, it, you know, moving to the West Coast and even just getting an offer yeah. to move, they said, we'll move you. And I thought, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure about that? <laughs> uh, and they just threw wow. everything at me. And this was me moving full into tech. Um, so of course I said yes, but they wanted me fast. It was like, you have three weeks to do this. And I said, sure, no problem. There's nothing in the way. But also just to your point, culturally, yeah. um, I'm African. Um, my parents, you know, the rules were in doctor, lawyer, engineer. So technically I was failure right. from the get go. So I think even around that time frame of like 2002 to 2009 or so, Tech was just emerging, you know, a lot of innovation was happening at the time, and I was grateful to be a part of it, but my parents thought it was just one big joke or another bubble that would burst or a fad, so I was like, all right. It hasn't failed me yet, right. um, but it was just too new for anyone to really grasp and understand just how it would change us as a society um, in good sure? and bad ways. Well, were you sure of the decision, or were you kind of going at it like, I want it to work. I'll do what I can to make it work, but I don't know if it's going to work. Or were you never? Were you scared? Yeah. Were you were you financially prepared prepared for something like that? I had no savings. Remember? Wow. I I'm the queen of fake it till you make it. So you it. went from New York all the Welcome way to Atlanta. Atlanta. <laughs> I mean, I never I never stepped foot in Seattle before then. Wow. You had so never visited. No. I didn't care to. Wow. I mean, my interview I did spend a couple of mm -hmm. days. They flew me out to do that. Right. Um, but I wasn't interested in getting to know the place. I just wanted out. Mm. Like I tell people, like that was like an evacuation of sorts. That I just had to get out of New York. It was toxic. It it was bringing me down. I wasn't really moving or progressing anywhere. And I thought to myself after, like, well, what if I left New York ten years prior? I probably would have been able to retire by now, yeah. for sure, for sure. I always say like that one decision you make just changed the whole trajectory of your life. And it. Mm. So when you got there, what? What did you like about Seattle? Um, what, did, what was that real estate market like? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I got there in early 2017. And because I was leaving New York, which is, you know, city that never sleeps, right. you know, a lot of urban noise and, you know, theatrics and whatnot, I didn't want to go shifting from that straight into a house or straight into like a suburban year. I had to do that transition first. Okay. Um, so I went. And you have the money. That's <laughs> that one. <laughs> what you <laughs> um, But the the rent was insane when was I it? got there. I stayed in a rent controlled apartment in New York for ten years. Only paid a thousand dollars. Only paid a thousand. And I'm I complained about it. Right. Um, and then get to Seattle, and I think my first apartment was like twenty four hundred, including wow. the parking. How many one bedroom? Mm -hmm. Wow. But I think it was probably like six fifty to seven hundred square foot. Um, but it was in a nice, you know, up and coming area, Capitol Hill. And what I, is up and coming? We're, that's that's a real estate term. What would you consider? What did you experience as up and coming? Gentrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I mean, this was industrial. It was a very okay, industrial okay. city, a lot of warehouses. I think the building I moved into first was like an old BMW dealership. Oh, God. Oh, God. Which was cool because the aesthetic of the building that they made, uh, that they built or developed, was just very unique. Um, it had like a little masculine flair to it, but I didn't care. You had barn doors all over the apartment, uh, full amenities. And I didn't even know what an amenity was coming from New York. <laughs> New York, it was like, if you don't have to do alternate side parking, that's like an amenity. That's the benefit. Right. right. That's the benefit. Um, so yeah, I got settled there. Um, started working in 2017 in, I want to say June or July. And then it took, you know, the first year. So for those who are not familiar with tech, you know, some of the initial perks they give you, it's not really like the pension or like you're right. not looking forward to that. They give you what's called RSUs or restricted stock units. So mm -hmm. to entice and incentivize new talent, they will give you this huge package. So your comp package will be your base salary. It'll be your stock uh, units and maybe a bonus or something to sweeten the pot. I also got relocation paid for full upfront. Nice. Um, the, the contingency with that is if you get fired or quit before in the first year, back. you got to pay it back. <laughs> so I'm walking around being real nice right. to everybody. Right. Um, so, you know, I kind of had to read through all those terms and conditions before I even decided I was going to do it. And I'm like, check, check. I can do that too. Um, so I had to find my own apartment or actually that you could use the relocation team to help find, um, uh, housing, whether they could put you up in temporary housing for a little bit. I just was like, no, I'll figure this out on my own. Uh, and then a lot of people use it to go straight into homeownership. Mm -hmm. I think they probably do that more now. Yes. That's when they yeah. used There to are before. some companies that do. They'll pay like help with their moving expenses or help with your down payment or something. It's a package. But for you, yeah. when you when you left to go to Seattle, it still wasn't even about home ownership. It was just about, I need to. A fresh start. A fresh start. A fresh start. And so you're in Seattle for how long when you get the bug of like, maybe I should buy some. You guys have first base, right? Probably about. <laughs> you got like, your first base. Back. <laughs> you're right. Because I mean, the, the first bonuses and stock units and those stock units have a, a shelf life of like mm -hmm. four years i used to see a lot of peers that would go and buy lambos day dot or buy expensive mm -hmm. penthouses that money dries out it does. after mm -hmm. a certain unless you can do something with it exceptional for them to give you more mm -hmm. uh, and refresh it, it runs out so i i had to be smart because a i didn't have a lot of money and two i was coming into new money at the time so i said let me rent for a while kind of get adjusted uh, and acclimate to my new environment and then see what happens. So it's probably about a year after renting. Okay. And then it was the uh, the rent renewals were coming up mm -hmm. and the increase was <laughs> Once you see that rent, astronomical. Yeah, I asked the the property managers yeah. that what's your rent cap? And they're like, what's that? <laughs> and it wasn't, it didn't exist. It was like 15, 20% even. It was going up. Wow. And I thought, this is illegal. I need to call somebody. Right. Um, but because there was no limit, they could, I mean, I started off with 24, I think the next year they wanted to increase to $600 and I thought that's well over two mortgages. So no. So that really is what prompted me to start looking at other options. Um, did but, you have any friends like either back in New York or that you had met there that had started buying or were in your ear, had good or bad experiences? That you no, know, the, the, the story behind like the day that I had this kind of like call to action yeah. i had promised myself moving to seattle like you said a fresh start clean mm -hmm. slate i don't know anybody they're all passive aggressive so it was like an oasis you know in new york if you call it's someone blunt. you know it's very blunt in new york yeah. but if you make plans you made plans right. they're gonna hunt you down like i got dressed today we're going out and you're like no i kind of don't want to in seattle well, they'll have a full dialogue just like we're having now and they'll cancel on you before you can make an excuse and i'm like <laughs> awesome. So I went out one night, uh, the happening spot over there where all the affluent who's who's go um, is a city called Bellevue. Yeah. And I went out, met some friends, met up with some colleagues that I worked with at the time, got pretty lit, pretty lit. And I get home, I get home in one piece. But I wake up on the couch, full face and makeup, wake to the side, can't <laughs> find my keys. And I'm like, oh no, I've relapsed to my old life. Mm. I got up, grabbed the Gatorade, took a shower, and just started going through my phone, called a Redfin agent, and I said, show me a house today. Wow. Just like today. that. Yes. So what I 
observe from you is that you are very spontaneous. Like you will just have I'm this, playing. you will just <laughs> pulse in, you will just have these moments of like clarity. Like I need to do this now. And there's so were you happy in Seattle though? Because we always think yeah. about you know, especially when people are relocating. Like yeah. we've actually recommended that people will rent first to mm. get familiar with the area, which you did, which you which did, you did yeah. to yeah. make sure that like yeah, this is for me. Did you have that or were you just scared of, oh, wait, old habits are creeping back. I need to do something dramatic to convince myself that I'm not falling back into old habits or were you happy in Seattle? Have you been to Seattle? You never met her back. No shit. But I can't say I ever like fell in love with the city. It's, it's a very nice, beautiful place. I think if you're more into um, like outdoors type yeah. stuff, nature and that type of thing, that's your, it's that's great. For it's it. amazing. Fishing and all that. I'm a city girl. So it was hard to start to make that adjustment. Yeah. And the house that I ended up buying was way, way out in the woods. And mm. I think if you are, uh, if you have a family, it's a great place to raise kids. If you just want to get away and escape from people and no one's going to come Clearly. looking for you, that's great place to start <laughs> over. But I liked it because it made me, it forced me to focus. I didn't have the distractions and the, yo, we're at such and so, it's downtown, call up. I didn't have any of that. Mm -hmm. I legit just had nothing else to do but to focus on me. And I needed that. I needed yeah. four years of that. That's how long I stayed there. And I don't regret it, but would I go back again on purpose? No. no. So when you went, so this is interesting from our perspective, because again, taking you behind the front door, we're getting it from the client's perspective, we had gone through the process that obviously became family to us. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. from our perspective, when we have conversations with clients, uh, it's a big decision, right? To to purchase a home and, and some of these cities in Atlanta is one of them, they're considered like a transient city. People come and go, yeah. people relocate from here. We got a ton of yep. New York, LA, Miami. Um, so when you went to the Redfin, because this is one of our pet peeves as we'll talk about our experience <laughs> when we first met you. But so you're looking at a Redfin and some people are on those sites like Zillow and all that kind of stuff. And you're looking, are you looking and not even knowing what that process looks like? Are you just looking for pretty houses? Like what was that objective that morning? And did you go through that pre-approval process or did you just go out there and start looking at houses? No, no pre-approval process. So it's it that's the distinction between what I experienced there so, versus what I yeah. found here, which we'll get into. But right. um, I looked at Redfin as kind of like the like the McDonald's of real estate. Like they, you could copy and cut and paste the same formula right. over and over again. But it, it seemed more white glove to me that experience because I didn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. I, I I had not ventured out far enough to know areas, locations, um, you know, um, what was around, like shopping centers, malls, things like that. So I went in blind, oh. and I guess so did she. Um, but she was like, sure, up. She's like, where do you want to look? And I said, anywhere that's outside of like city center. So you hit the button and she's the one that calls you because that's how Redfin is, it's just like. Yeah, she like, called me within like an hour or two and mm -hmm. I said, when can we meet up? And mm -hmm. we, I drove north to meet her. And she just took me to a bunch of random places throughout uh, the Snohomish County area, mm -hmm. uh, which is like 30 miles north of the city. So when, you, so when you reach out, she follows up, and now you want to go look at houses. I'm just curious. Yeah. What criteria? Right? What was the criteria that she leveraged to say, yeah, I'll take you out? Because are you looking at condos, okay. single family? Like, how did, so you're just looking on the site. And saying that looks nice. I just want to go there, check it so out. To be honest, I don't think I picked anything out. I just said, show me something. That's it. Yeah, that she does. That, that, that would definitely won't work. That would. Ne I mean, with us, I would say that would never happen. I think you know we yeah. can get in. So maybe that's yeah. We get to tell. But us as the first story. time home buyer, right. that helped. Right. Like she was very hands on. And did it help or hurt though? And I'm asking from the perspective of you're a first time home buyer who admittedly you haven't done any of your own research as far as what the process is, what should I have in place before I start the process. You hadn't done any of that style of home. Right. right. And so yeah. from interesting enough, from your perspective as the customer, like yeah. the agent was great because she just she, showed you anything. She you just wanted. showed you anything you want it. But I think from a professional perspective, I'd be like, I think she wasted a lot 
of time and also did you a disservice because you weren't educated on the investment that you were about to embark on. You were just about to drop a bunch of money for a property without really understanding or knowing like all of the nuances that go into that. So yeah. how did you even like get to a point where you, was there something on the site where it showed like an estimated payment? I'm just curious to know like yeah. how, like I was assuming that was really what drove you. Uh, as yeah. far as can I afford this? So we we did have like a, a meetup first where okay. I met her for coffee yeah. and some really good croissants. I remember that. <laughs> um, and we, we did kind of go through a little bit of discovery conversation yeah. first before we actually ventured out. So we did it in the same day. Okay. Yeah. Um, but I didn't have a lot to work with. Like I didn't I didn't know anything. So she was like, well, what are you looking for? Do you want, you know, a house? Do you want a townhome? And I said, whatever you have. So she I wasn't concerned about... Um, what your needs were like how close or far do you need to be from an office how close like that was not at all part mm -hmm. of the search criteria no and at the time i don't really think i was that picky i mean i just said anything out of the city which we were already out of the city yeah. so she really just had that to work with mm. uh, so i just followed her lead now like you said having a lot of that knowledge up front would have helped me kind of refine down right. to what it is that i needed and be a lot more specific but as we went further and further along in the process, she was doing a lot of hand mulling. Like we sat and read my entire contract line by line. A lot of people wouldn't do that. Right. Yeah. Would not do that. Um, she taught me the ins and outs of like, you know, how to do home inspections. And she knew this area. She grew up there, lived there for over 40 years. So, and it, it's funny because I met other people who worked in real estate in that area. I remember that same bar that I, you know, crashed out at <laughs> um, I met a younger girl who was working I mean she wasn't working there but she was there mm. and we, I just kind of was like hey girl you're cute and she handed me her card and I said yeah if this doesn't work out this agent that I'm working with I'll hit you up but mm. remember I'm not you know in a contract with this person right. so I could have easily moved without any consequence whatsoever um, the short version of the story is the younger girl was just in it for the optics and lifestyle and things As like a that. Lot of real, yeah, so yeah, I think yeah. I would have been worse off with her than the more mature person who knows a lot more about mm -hmm. the industry. But to your point, like I would have been better off, even better off just having the knowledge of like the lending pro like the, the lending process is what drove me to drink. Really? Like my skin broke out. I was having like anxiety attacks and it was self-sabotage because I was reading things like, Oh, you do this, you'll lose your your funding or your your all. Yeah. You know? So I really wasn't harassing or nagging my agent about that. Yeah. Once I got a loan officer who was also very sweet and patient, I would send her emails in the middle of the night in bed, like, "Is this gonna happen to me?" And she's like, "Bro," <laughs> she's like, "Bro, put the phone down, just go to sleep." And I'm like, "Okay." And then I find another article. So I was just spiraling out of the lack of knowledge and experience, and I didn't have anyone personal or close to me to go to. My mom was like, yeah, you could get the house on a credit card. And I thought, Great. <laughs> a credit card. why would I do that? She's like, your daddy did it. I said, oh, uh, it's a, it's a generational, it's a generational thing. Yeah. So I, I couldn't even get mad at that because they did what they had to do. Right. But I just thought, geez, like I had no one to go to. Wow. Did, so you go through this process. Do you feel how you went about it, doing it? looking at homes first, then the lending process, do you feel that caused you any pain points or any issues along the way once you got the house? Like, do you, were there questions you wish you had asked before you bought the house? I don't think so. I mean, the, the, the lending process was not the worst part. I was just making it right. be, you know. Was it, so it was a resale house, right? How many bedrooms and baths? Was uh, it was a, a new construction. New construction, right? Nice. Yeah, it was new oh. construction. Um, so the lot of land itself was a single family house. Okay. Um, the owners of that lot, of that home, were, I think they got paid off like $2 million to, to sell. Oh, wow. And they bulldozed that. And then they put up about, I want to say 40 units, town owned yeah. units. Oh. Really, really nice units. Yeah. And they averaged somewhere between, at that point, it was like the early to mid fours. Mm -hmm. So I met with the, um, the builder agent, I think is what yeah, she was referring to. Mm -hmm. Um, and you walked through one of the model homes in the front. And this is always like throwing me off with new builds is that 
I get attached to the model. It's not like I'm looking at the pictures online or fascinated. I get stuck with the model and all the details and, and the bells and whistles that they put into the right. Model. But when they're building my home, there's tons of layouts to choose from. And when I got into what became my unit, it looked nothing like the model home at all. So I'm like, okay, I guess that worked out okay. Um, so, <laughs> not what I wanted, but I guess it worked out okay. Right. Um, and the market at the time was highly volatile because we have a lot of transplants that are coming, and just like myself. So in between 2017 and 2018, which is when I started this process, um, it, I was being outbid everywhere, just about it, for any house that I looked at. So the first unit I bid on was outbid catch. Second unit, catch. Third unit, I called the agent and I said, hey, D, um, if this doesn't come through, I'm, I'm over it. Three strikes and I'm out. I'll just rinse until I can't stomach it anymore. And she's like, all right. And it was Easter Sunday. Mm. And somehow that worked in my favor because they didn't show houses on that Sunday. And then I got the call back on Monday that it fell through again. But there was a house, or unit rather, right next door to it that they would, the builder was willing to give me with no cops. So of course I go, what's wrong with it? Right. And they're like, nothing. It's like 150 square foot larger than the one next to you. Oh, that the one that you originally bid on. Um, there's privacy front and back where like usually you'd be looking at another home or unit before in front of you or behind you. They had like this cute like retention pond in the back. And I'm like, what's wrong with it? Because why would you give me something that's better? It had a balcony. Where, uh, and I'm thinking that whoever the guy is next door that paid an extra 50K. He's going to feel a way that you're getting a better unit. I felt a way. What were you thinking? Right. right. Um, and I finally moved in and I, I met him. And I'm like, now all, a lot of this information is public. Um, once they finished closing out the development. So I could see all my neighbors, like how much they paid, how much square footage. And I thought, wow, I would have never paid that. So I ended up at striking out because the interest rates were decent at the time. I think mm. it was like around 4%. Uh, and I said I wasn't going to go over 5 As a new, as a first-time home buyer, that, that, that was like my risk tolerance threshold. The price point was within range, even though it, I stretched it a little bit. A little bit. Um, HOA was like 100 bucks. They took care of everything on the exterior. So it was a good, I think, starter home yeah. to get that transition out of city life, to get out of rental, apartment rental life, and start kind of getting familiar with the home ownership process. All right, so let's talk about the good stuff. So you are settled in Seattle, mm -hmm. purchased the home, have lived in about four years? Four years, right? Rents it for one year and lived in the house. Three, three. Okay. And then you decide, I wanna move again to Atlanta. Why? Well, we gotta go back. So I didn't really decide, but I manifest, remember? Mm -hmm. So I knew Seattle was not forever. It was just a stepping stone to get to wherever home would eventually be. But I do remember um, the company I worked for in New York before I left to move to Seattle was actually, um, I mean, they're, they're based all over the place, but their tech hub was in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. So I was bi-coastal uh, for the two or three years that I was there. And then the, I would always do holiday planning. So I would I was in retail, so I would plan Black Friday, Cyber Monday sales, and that work happened in Atlanta. Mm. So that's where I really got my first taste to Atlanta, the city, Georgia. Um, and we would fly down my team um, every around this, maybe October, um, just to kind of lock in all the readiness activities. We do like drills and tabletop, like what happens if like sales don't happen or the you know server or hardware goes down. So we would spend that time doing prep. But while I was here, I used to like sneak out with some of the team and go out to like some of the local places that the the center of our distribution was in john's creek uh -huh. so um i would rent a car or whatever i'd get into hartsfield and then i'd force someone else to drive because i hate driving um and we would end up at places like boogaloo and just kind of float around downtown so that drive was about 45 minutes if i remember yes yeah door to door um and i just kind of started to like it but i wasn't in love with it yet mm -hmm. Um, what were your first impressions, honestly? I mean, I wanted to go to a trap house or something. <laughs> to see the real Atlanta, because I'm from New York, and that's a whole different yes. scene. Right. So now I'm kind of getting a taste for all these different parts of the country, and I thought Atlanta's very different. Were you into the reality shows and Housewives and all that stuff? Yeah, back then. All I the hip hop. It was. <laughs> and I probably ran into a few. I mean, yeah. everything's filmed in yeah. Atlanta, so I probably did see. Yeah. 
uh, some tapings going on around the city, but it, it, this being starstruck is not something that's uh, well from New York. You don't get you see everything, yeah. So you're just like, oh yeah, it's Buster Rhymes. Or Slick Rick was my mom's neighbor. Right. His mother, his mother, and my mother lived like doors down from each other. So I didn't really get that, but um, I did get a, a sense for the flavor, a sense for the food. Yeah, um, the soul food here kicked me in a good way, and I thought, oh, I'd really like to come back to visit. Okay. is where I left at. Okay. So once I get back to Seattle. Or once I moved to Seattle, because I'd already left that company, um, you know, tech was springing up all over the West Coast. Mm -hmm. I kind of expanded outside of Silicon Valley, went up to Seattle. And I remember saying at the time, like, tech should be on the East Coast. Mm -hmm. And um, the company I was working for at the time had started kind of like this dating show type style auditions where they wanted to kind of court different cities throughout the country to see where they would build their next headquarters. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta. It has everything that it wanted set up. It has the infrastructure. It has Marta. Um, it, it has space. Yeah. Um, and there was plenty of land for it to set up shop. And they ended up in New York, which was weird yeah. in the beginning. And then they ended up conceding and going to, uh, I think, Virginia. So once I saw that, I thought the I think the buzz started to, to, to start where I was like, oh, maybe there's hope for me to go back east. I missed home. Um, I was three hours behind. My but did family. you want to go back to New York, or because you 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 did so much to pull yourself and remove yourself from New York? So were you now getting that itch to go back? The itch, I kind of miss it. I want to go back to that, or did you know you just wanted to be closer, but not there? Closer. Okay. And it's weird because growing up from New York, I would leave all the time, and I remember I would always leave and say, "I'm a diehard New York. I'm going home. Home is home, and New York is home." And I was starting to say, "Well." Nervous I, but I don't want to. I don't want to stay there. So, I wasn't quite sure on where I would land. Still, but I knew East was definitely the thing. The closest thing that I probably would have would have come second runner up to that might have been like Arizona. And I fell in love when I was eighteen, yeah. and now that's being run down by Beverly Hills and Vegas. Right, right. Um, but really, what the ultimate decider or decision for that was um, was me getting a new job. So I wasn't looking, I wasn't aggressively looking for new work, uh, but another company, uh, I guess you can consider them a competitor, reached out. And at first I thought, you know, you get a lot of hits in your inbox from recruiters and LinkedIn hits and you're like, yeah, I'm not interested. But something told me, again, just respond. Yeah, just okay. respond. Mm -hmm. And they were very aggressive and they're not used, they're not known for that. So they were like, yeah, we need you. I think this time it was like around October. And I was on the midst of planning yet another sale at this company that I was working for now in Seattle. And I said, this isn't a good time, but when do you need me? And they were like, December. So I thought, okay, December the following year, mm -hmm. which would have been 2021. Okay. Right? No, no, no. It was 2019. Mm. Uh, it was October of 2019. Um, and now by this time, we're also in the middle or getting ready to go into a full-blown quarantine, which we didn't oh, know at the time. Right, we didn't know at the time. Of so I said, yeah, the December of 2020 works for me. And they're like, no, we mean this year, which would have been like four or five weeks away. Um, and I didn't really have a lot of time to decide a lot of things. The offer that was presented was to hire me, in December, they wanted me to choose locations, and I thought this plate, this particular company, had an office right across the street from the one I was already in. So I'm thinking, oh, it's across the street. And they said, no, we need you either in Austin, Texas, which I've never been in uh, or visited before, or Atlanta, Georgia, which I had visited before, but really didn't have like a strong connection to it. Um, so I said, let me think about it and get back to you. So that's when I started kind of like thinking like, well, if I have to get up and leave, then yeah. let me start figuring out what my options are, resources, right. things like that. Uh, and I just started kind of like using social media as like a yellow pages to just start exploring. Like, what does Atlanta look like? What does Austin look like? And I would kind of dig through either explore feeds, hashtag searches, or pages, popular pages to see what was out there. And then did you hear the words, hey guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't even think that our our families and our parents and that generation, I don't think that they really look or have ever looked at home ownership for what the appreciated value is. I think they yeah. bought homes to raise their family. Yeah. And, and send them. And settle. And that was the American dream. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so.